Raise your hand if you speak fluently a language other than English. Look at that. Okay. All right. Keep your hand up if the language other than English is something other than Spanish, French, or a Chinese dialect. So look at that's. I mean, I do this every now and again. All right. Okay. Who thinks they have one that no one else in the room speaks? Keep your hand up. So what do you have? Go ahead. Hebrew. Someone else in the room speaks Hebrew. I would guess. Go ahead. German. German. Someone else in the room speaks German. Go ahead. Right here. Polish. Polish here. What did you say? Uganda, is that what you said? Wow. I'm not sure about Polish. Well, German, that might be. Yeah, go ahead. Africa. Okay, so wow. Yeah, fascinating. All right, now, my point isn't to just sort of pull foreign language, which is a wholly different topic. Um, it's to speak to what a kind of diverse and interesting set of students that we have here. And in all my times that I've been involved in debate, one of the most tricky and delicate issues to get people to agree upon, to get people to talk about, are issues that relate to trans restroom access. It is a very controversial item, and it is an item that when you read all of the literature that's been submitted, you can even go and look at some of the briefs that have been submitted to the Supreme Court on this issue, you find a wider range of opinions not just the obvious ones between people that are very, very conservative on the issue or very, very liberal on the issue, but people that fall somewhere in between. It's just, it, it is a tricky issue. And if you have never encountered the issue, I want to say that this morning's discussion is something where you should feel incredibly comfortable asking questions and kind of I and the staff will be happy to kind of field your questions and do our best to kind of give you an answer. So don't be afraid. Don't think that it's an item that you're not welcome to ask about. And that might more broadly hold for the entire discussion. This is a slightly confusing affirmative starter pack. It deals with federal courts and judicial deference. And you would be well within your rights to have never studied that before. It's OK. You came to debate camp. And I often am concerned when day one is overwhelming and so one of the things we do is have a discussion like this so that when you start to debate the starter pack, you'll find it to not be so overwhelming. And if you do have a moment where you think this is confusing, think about everyone else in this room, all the intelligent, interesting, diverse people we have in this room, it's almost certain that someone else has the same question. And we don't need to get through all 30 of my slides today. What we need for you to do is understand the starter pack and the issue of trans restroom access a little bit better. So let's kind of launch into our discussion here. My name is Will. You can call me Will. Um, this is Kirby. He's confused. Why? Because the opening starter pack is a little bit confusing. But you should feel free, as I mentioned before. Oh, it's not going. It's frozen. It's frozen. Well, there you go. Then you're like, who is Kirby? All right. My bad. What's that? The projector's on freeze. The projector's on freeze. Okay. We're, we're wandering into an area of um, Will's very mediocre strength here. What's that? On the remote from the projector, there should be a button that says freeze. Can you just press that? On the remote for the projector, which I do not see. All right. Or it's on the actual projector. So, like, there's. Now the photos are being taken. Thank you, Lyra. Well timed. Could not hear this. Huh. Pipkin, are you able to help here? This was just going for Maggie, wasn't it? A little time out. OK. 
Okay. So it goes here, but then I know it does it from there. Let's jump into this and just kind of start over. All right, so there are four key concepts that I want you to kind of grasp at the end of the day. Time permits, I'll be in to pick one. And uh, I'm going to kind of give you the short version of each up front, and then we'll go from there. So concept number one involves simply understanding where the status quo is at status quo, Latin, current state of affairs, and the negative often defends it, uh, and the affirmative often indicts it. And here, the status quo is what I have written. I won't read it out to you, but I'll basically say that in different areas of the country, there are different policies, and it often differs between school districts as to whether or not a student that would identify as trans would be allowed to use the restroom of their choice. And sometimes I use the word bathroom, sometimes I use the word restroom. It often also applies to like locker rooms, etc. And this has become, I think as you may know, a very significant issue in kind of modern education debates as to how this is going to be handled. Here's some typing, so I'll give people one more second there. And I'll, I'll even see if you all have any questions about anything that I just, as it relates to that concept. Okay. Yeah. So then, like, where do they go? They okay. Know. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question, if you couldn't hear it, was where do trans students go? So uh, it would depend on the school policy. Usually there are three options. 
Option number one is that schools allow students to go to the restroom that corresponds with how they identify. Secondly, students are forced to go to a bathroom that corresponds with the sex they were assigned at birth, even if they don't identify with the sex that they were assigned at birth. So when you were born, a state, a hospital, uh, in nearly all instances will assign you a sex based on anatomy. And if over time you do not identify with that, some school districts will still force you to kind of go with that assessment. And then the third and increasingly common option is that there are unisex restrooms or restrooms used by faculty that sometimes students that identify as trans are asked to use. And that is part of the controversy that we'll talk about. Um, but I think that that's a great question. Any other questions? Yeah. Do they have to like like apply like a, get like a certain form to say that they are trans? Do they have to wear like a special tag if they are? Trans? Okay. So the question is, you know, do they have to somehow indicate? Is that yeah. a better way to say it? Uh, that they are trans. So first of all, uh, yeah. One thing that's always fascinating to me as I've studied this question is like you know, who is policing any of this? Does that make sense? And a lot of students probably use the restroom and none of the other students care. In fact, a lot of the objection that occurs is from parents, etc. But uh, in a lot of these instances, they'll either be a student that does come forward to the administration and says, you know, I would like to use a restroom that's different than the restroom that maybe I used in the same school district last year, uh, or the student um, that will be brought to the attention by a third party from a, you know, a teacher, a fellow student, etc., and then the issue will be resolved. Um, so I think I've sort of answered your question. I'll get at that more. Anything else? Go ahead. What I don't understand is why is this an issue so many people are getting hyped up about? I mean, okay. trans people have been using the bathroom for years on end without any problems, and all of a sudden there's just this big reformation where all of a sudden now kids can get genital surgeries and other crazy things, and all of a sudden this has become a reissue again just because people have something to latch on to get angry and upset about. What I don't understand is just how can this be an issue when there's so many other issues that are much more pressing? <coughs> okay, so there's a lot that you said there, okay? And I want to make sure I, I understand the gist of your question. Is your question, why are people frustrated if a trans student uses a restroom that identifies, that, that they identify, or is... No, my question is, yeah. how... Why is this such a big issue when you're a couple of years Okay, so here's the heart of the controversy, okay? I think that for a lot of people, let's say the generation of my father, who's in his 70s, had never encountered anyone that identified as trans. And so it's just an enormous adjustment, the very idea that everyone that's born a boy is not always a boy, and not everyone who's born as a female, as not a female. So that controversy is new to a lot of people that are older than this generation. Um, and there are certainly religious organizations that are reluctant to make this change. On the other hand, and I'm not 100% sure if this is what you're getting at, there are a lot of surveys of students, high school age students, uh, K through 12 students, that don't really register a very big objection and don't find it to be a very big deal if a student uses a restroom that doesn't correspond with their gender identity. So that is where the controversy rests. It's fundamentally a question of do we as a society acknowledge the right to kind of allow people to transition or do we not? Go ahead. All right, other questions? Last one and then I got to keep moving. I'm just having a thing here. Yeah. Does Canada's new gender, um, new non-gender birth law, help an argument that it helps to not assign gender at birth? Okay. So there was right before camp started, like a headline news style article that Canada is having policies that allow a child to not have sex gender assigned at birth. Okay, is that what you're asking about, that development? And so are you asking if that helps the affirmative or negative or how that kind of plays into this? 
I, I think it's part of a broadening social trend that the negative could argue means that acceptance of trans issues is on the arrow direction up. Does that make sense? But uh, the affirmative could easily argue that that's not in the United States. So, you know, that trend would need to kind of hit the United States. Uh, and it's, it's all very, very new. But that idea, to kind of go back to the analogy to my father who's in his 70s, that idea is totally unthinkable in 1980, if that makes sense. So it might be part of a broadening social trend. OK. Good question. Um, so what does the affirmative plan do in the starter pack? Again, I won't read it to you, and you can jot it down. But the short version is that it has the court make a decision that limits it to option number one of the three options that I articulated here. The first option allows students to use the bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity. And to be clear, 18 states and about 140 US cities do allow that. Certain school districts do as well. But the other 32 states and the bulk of the country do not have a policy that would correspond with that. And that would play into the question that we just had about Canada. In some ways, there is a trend afoot and change is happening. And the negative could argue that influences from Canada or 18 US states or 140 plus US big cities could, could change the status quo. The negative, um, the affirmative would probably say that that change is, is slow uh, and isn't happening quickly enough for a lot of students that would like to use the bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity when they're at school. Okay. So the next concept has less to do with the specifics of trans restroom access and more my desire to kind of teach you a little bit about courts. And this is definitely the part where Kirby is the most confused. And having worked on this affirmative earlier in the summer, I definitely thought that some of the students in the Hoya Spartan program struggled kind of understanding this. And if it doesn't make sense now, that's okay. I kind of want you to just jot it down and we'll explain it more elaborately as time goes on. As people finish typing, I'll say that I think most of you understand the concept of a precedent, maybe even from interactions in your own family, where if you get grounded for a certain set of behaviors, you know that it establishes kind of a precedent or standing policy in place that could apply to other circumstances. Deference is a little bit more complicated and it would be a lot of what we discussed today. Okay. And then the last concept I'll kind of talk about as I give you a chance to write it down. When the Trump administration took office, uh, relatively early on, in mid-February, the Trump administration passed a policy that said trans bathroom access in K-12 schools uh, was an item that should be determined by state and local governments. Prior to that, that was not the understanding that was in place. 
In fact, towards the end of the Obama administration, the Obama administration more aggressively said that trans restroom access is an issue that should not be left up to state and local control. And if states or localities chose to not allow restroom access that corresponded with gender identity, that states could lose federal funding, which Maggie talked about a little bit. So that switch between administrations is relevant to understanding not only the trans restroom issue, but maybe more broadly, does the Trump administration, in dealing with this issue, have they set a broader standard where states will have the flexibility to determine how a variety of civil rights issues will be handled? That's all in its infancy and it's all early, but we'll kind of see where it goes. All right, and I'll give you one more second to jot that down. Okay, so I didn't know how I felt about this photo. Um, I am hoping that the turtle is okay, all right? But it was what came up on a Google image search as it related to explaining the status quo, which was the first thing that you wrote down. And now I'm gonna kind of talk about that in greater detail. One of the weird things about how courts work in this country is that there are a variety of different district and federal courts that are determined by geography. So the courts in California might make a different ruling than the courts in Florida. Part of the reason that in a legal sense this issue is a big deal is in part because the courts have not reached a consensus on whether or not students will be allowed to use a bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity. The Whitaker case is a trans student that sued their school district. It kind of wound through the courts, and right before camp started, the student, Whitaker, from Wisconsin won, and now there's a precedent which applies to Wisconsin and surrounding areas that schools need to adjust to, which does allow trans bathroom access. Does anyone recognize or can anyone tell me anything about the second court case, Ivancho versus the Pine Ridge School District, Pine Ridge and School District? Okay, I think you actually will recognize it in a moment. So that is a, another federal court case that came out of the Pittsburgh area. And Avancho is a last name that might be familiar to you. Jackie Avancho is someone that uh, is a relatively famous singer, has kind of performed, I think got like second place in America's Got Talent. Jackie Avancho was asked to perform at the president's inauguration, as you may remember, the president, current president, struggles to find anyone to perform at his inauguration. She accepted, um, and Jackie Avancho, kind of after that inaugural concert series, said, "By the way, I have a trans sister, and my sister is." involved in a legal battle to seek trans restroom access and would you, Mr. Trump, meet with me and my sister and just have like a one-on-two -on -two discussion with someone that identifies as trans. The president denied that meeting even though Jackie Avancho performed at his inauguration. Some people think uh, it is because doesn't want to deal with the issue. Other people think it is because there is a court case that is going on, and there are rumors that that case could wind up in front of the Supreme Court. But to make a long story short, the Whitaker and Avancho case are victories for proponents of trans bathroom access. But the third case that I'm going to talk about, which is 
Gavin Grimm, and that's pronounced Gloucester County, uh, was not so much of a success. And uh, it is an interesting case that exposes that in Virginia, which is where Gloucester County is, there is a split. And so you have some parts of the country where trans bathroom access is legally permitted or even required, and other parts of the country where it is not. I'll pause there, and in a moment, I'll talk a little bit more about federal courts, but I just want to see if anyone has any questions about kind of where the status quo is and where the law is, how this is all work. Don't be afraid to ask. All right. Go ahead. I'm a little bit confused of where the case lies in on a bunch show um, versus the Pine Richland School. Yeah. Was that just talking about the event that occurred when Trump was communicating or refused to communicate? No, so the court case about Ivancho was not about Donald Trump and anything to do with the inauguration or anything like that. It was just even prior to Jackie Ivancho performing at the inauguration, there was a lawsuit between uh, Juliet Ivancho and two other students that identified as trans in the same school district. They took Pine Richland School District to court, um, and eventually it got, the way that these things work is that, you know, if you, if you win, then you're allowed trans bathroom access. If you lose, you can appeal. And ultimately, the appeals process wound up in the federal court system in Avancho 1. Now, that could change if the Supreme Court takes the case and rules against Avancho. But I mostly mentioned uh, everything about Jackie Avancho to kind of just speak to the kind of fascinating way in which that kind of got all the way to the president's desk in an unusual fashion. Go ahead. So, like, states have been, like... A little louder, please. Sorry. States have been, like, incredibly resourceful when it comes to, like, avoiding actually implementing uh, Supreme Court decisions. Yeah, Maggie, I think, spoke this morning about all the difficulties that existed with desegregating schools. Certainly, you're going to find states and even really school districts and even kind of more local level that might resist. Let's finish your question. Like, I, I'm just wondering, like, how, if there's, if you have any idea about, like, how states are going to go about that. Like, you, you, like, how, gonna happen, right? So, are you asking that, what would the affirmative say if the negative said, states will just resist? Just, just 32 like, states that don't like it now, you can't get them to change their mind, basically? Like, 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 yeah. Right. All right. So his question, if you couldn't hear it, is, you know, what, what enforcement mechanism is there to get the states to change their mind? They could lose federal funding, and federal funding is a big deal, all right? Most districts um, heavily rely upon it for their ability to kind of carry out their functions. They'd be in violation of a court order, so they'd be prone to lawsuits, and that creates a a different problem, when you're prone to lawsuits, even if you think you can win, as a school district, it costs an awful lot of money to fight those battles, and you might lose. So it's not very popular to take on a losing court battle. Yeah? Wouldn't like President Trump have to produce the federal government? Like, that's not something that would come with the victory of the Supreme Court case, right? I'm a little confused by that question. So if, if, the, if the affirmative said, if, if one of these people, one of these you know, sets of students wanting court in the Supreme Court, what would... Like, like he would, like, the federal funding would have just increased to, uh, to the school district that didn't do this. The president just, like, said that he doesn't, like, support the like, Oh, I see what you're saying. So... That we have to take the initiative to get this, like... So the federal courts can tell the president that the president is wrong. And as an aside, President Trump has not said that um, school districts cannot allow trans restroom access. The president has said up to this point that it's up to states and localities, all right? But if the Supreme Court weighed in on this, uh, as the Supreme Court did in gay marriage, there were people in the gay marriage decision, for instance, that refused to recognize marriage licenses that were between same-sex couples. And when that happened, and you're right, so there was resistance. When that happened, those cities and those clerks were prone to lawsuits, and that is where the change comes about. So I think that you're, you're on to something when you say that there will be resistance, but the court is, has built-in procedures that 
that even Donald Trump would struggle getting around, if that makes sense. Yeah. So for instance, when Donald Trump was lost, and he did lose several court cases on his travel restriction, all right, he couldn't just be like, I disagree. Now, he can appeal the decision, but we can't appeal beyond the Supreme Court, which is why the affirmative would probably use the Supreme Court. Two more, and then we'll keep going. Go ahead. So it is or is not unconstitutional to uh, not accommodate trans students? Okay, so the question is, is it constitutional or not to accommodate trans students? All right, and the answer is that the courts have not come up with a single answer to that question. And we exist in an absurd world where the law is different in one part of the country than it is in another part of the country, which means that if Julia Mancho were to travel from Pittsburgh to rural Virginia, the policies would be different in those areas. All right? So that's, that's sort of one of the reasons why the Supreme Court might actually take this case in the real world is to resolve that sort of patchwork of confusion. Yeah. So these cases that like favored and like they were the trans student, yes. are those precedents are those affecting more public schools or So all of this applies to public schools, right? Uh, that's a great question. The question was, does this apply to public schools? Yes, a private school um, can make its own procedures, uh, and they don't exist with the threat of losing federal funds because private schools don't accept federal funds. They're private. Okay. All right. Last one. Go ahead. Uh, if the negative decides to read like uh, an amendment counterplan. If the negative reads an amendment counterplan, okay, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I like it. What are the solvency yeah. deficits that are in the future of the debate? The reasons why the court is preferable, like judicial activism is good. Yeah, there's a, there's a range of things about the importance of the judicial branch acting, but that that is a very good question. Okay. All right. So let's keep moving here. Here's how the federal courts work. There's actually 13 of them, although only 11 exist. All right? And, or only 11 are on that picture. 13 exist. Sorry. One of them's in DC, one of them. Three options that I articulated here. The first option allows students to use the bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity. And to be clear, 18 states and about 140 US cities do allow that. Certain school districts do as well. But the other 32 states and the bulk of the country do not have a policy that would correspond with that. And that would play into the question that we just had about Canada. In some ways, there is a trend afoot and change is happening. And the negative could argue that influences from Canada or 18 US states or 140 plus US big cities could, could change the status quo. The negative, um, the affirmative would probably say that that change is, is slow uh, and isn't happening quickly enough for a lot of students that would like to use the bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity when they're at school. Okay. So the next concept has less to do with the specifics of trans restroom access and more my desire to kind of teach you a little bit about courts. And this is definitely the part where Kirby is the most confused. And having worked on this affirmative earlier in the summer, I definitely thought that some of the students in the Hoya Spartan program struggled kind of understanding this. And if it doesn't make sense now, that's okay. I kind of want you to just jot it down and we'll explain it more elaborately as time goes on. As people finish typing, 
I'll say that I think most of you understand the concept of a precedent, maybe even from interactions in your own family, where if you get grounded for a certain set of behaviors, you know that it establishes kind of a precedent or standing policy in place that could apply to other circumstances. Deference is a little bit more complicated and it would be a lot of what we discussed today. Okay. And then the last concept I'll kind of talk about as I give you a chance to write it down. When the Trump administration took office, uh, relatively early on, in mid-February, the Trump administration passed a policy that said trans bathroom access in K-12 schools uh, was an item that should be determined by state and local governments. Prior to that, that was not the understanding that was in place. In fact, towards the end of the Obama administration, the Obama administration more aggressively said that trans restroom access is an issue that should not be left up to state and local control. And if states or localities chose to not allow restroom access that corresponded with gender identity, that states could lose federal funding which Maggie talked about a little bit. So that switch between administrations is relevant. <coughs> Understanding not only the trans restroom issue, but maybe more broadly, does the Trump administration, in dealing with this issue, have they set a broader standard where states will have the flexibility to determine how a variety of civil rights issues will be handled? That's all in its infancy and it's all early, but we'll kind of see where it goes. All right, I'll give you one more second to jot that down. Okay, so I didn't know how I felt about this photo. Um, I'm hoping that the turtle is okay, all right? But it was what came up on a Google image search as it related to explaining the status quo, which was the first thing that you wrote down. And now I'm gonna kinda talk about that in greater detail. One of the weird things about how courts work in this country is that there are a variety of different district and federal courts that are determined by geography. So the courts in California might make a different ruling than the courts in Florida. Part of the reason that in a legal sense this issue is a big deal is in part because the courts have not reached a consensus on whether or not students will be allowed to use a bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity. The Whitaker case is a trans student that sued their school district. It kind of wound through the courts, and right before camp started, the student, Whitaker, from Wisconsin won, and now there's a precedent which applies to Wisconsin and surrounding areas that schools need to adjust to, which does allow trans bathroom access. Does anyone recognize or can anyone tell me anything about the second court case, Ivancho versus the Pine Ridge School District, Pine Ridge and School District? Okay, I think you actually will recognize it in a moment. So that is a, another federal court case that came out of the Pittsburgh area. And Ivancho is a last name that might be familiar to you. Jackie Ivancho is someone that uh, is a relatively famous singer, has kind of performed, I think got like second place in America's Got Talent. Jackie Avancho was asked to perform at the president's inauguration, as you may remember the president, current president struggles to find anyone to perform at his inauguration. She accepted, 
Um, and Jackie Avancho kind of, after that inaugural concert series, said, by the way, I have a trans sister, and my sister is involved in a legal battle to seek trans restroom access, and would you, Mr. Trump, meet with me and my sister and just have like a one-on-two -on -two discussion with someone that identifies as trans? The president denied that meeting, even though Jackie Avancho performed at his inauguration. Some people think uh, it is because she doesn't want to deal with the issue. Other people think it is because there is a court case that is going on, and there are rumors that that case could wind up in front of the Supreme Court. But to make a long story short, the Whitaker and Avancho case are victories for proponents of trans bathroom access. But the third case that I'm going to talk about, which is Gavin Grimm, and that's from Gloucester County, uh, was not so much of a success. And uh, it is an interesting case that exposes that in Virginia, which is where Gloucester County is, there is a split. And so you have some parts of the country where trans bathroom access is legally permitted or even required in other parts of the country where it is not. I'll pause there, and in a moment, I'll talk a little bit more about federal courts, but I just want to see if anyone has any questions about kind of where the status quo is and where the law is. How does it all work? Don't be afraid to ask. All right. Go ahead. I'm a little bit confused of where the case lies in on Avancho um, versus the Pine Richland School. Yeah. Was that just talking about the event that occurred when Trump was communicating or refused to communicate? No, so the court case about Avancho was not about Donald Trump and anything to do with the inauguration or anything like that. It was just even prior to Jackie Avancho performing at the inauguration, there was a lawsuit between uh, Juliet Avancho and two other students that identified as trans in the same school district. They took Pine Richland School District court, um, and eventually it got, the way that these things work is that, you know, if you, if you win, then you're allowed trans bathroom access. If you lose, you can appeal. And ultimately, the appeals process wound up in the federal court system in Avancho 1. Now, that could change if the Supreme Court takes the case and rules against Avancho. But I mostly mentioned uh, everything about Jackie Avancho to kind of just speak to the kind of fascinating way in which that kind of got all the way to the president's desk in an unusual fashion. Go ahead. So, like, states have been, like... A little louder, please. Sorry. States have been, like, incredibly resourceful when it comes to, like, avoiding actually implementing uh, Supreme Court decisions. Yeah, Maggie, I think, spoke this morning about all the difficulties that existed with desegregating schools. Certainly, you're going to find states and even really school districts and even kind of more local level that might resist. Let's finish your question. Like, I, I'm just wondering, like, how, if there's, if you have any idea of, like, how states are going to go about that. Because, like, you, you like, how, how it's going to happen, right? So, are you asking that, what would the affirmative say if the negative said, states will just resist? Just, just. 32 states that don't like it now, you can't get them to change their mind, basically? Like, a, like, non Yeah. Right. All right. So his question, if you couldn't hear it, is you know what what enforcement mechanism is there to get the states to change their mind? They could lose federal funding, and federal funding is a big deal. All right. Most districts um, heavily rely upon it for their ability to kind of carry out their functions. They'd be in violation of a court order, so they'd be prone to lawsuits. And that creates a, a different problem. When you're prone to lawsuits, even if you think you can win, as a school district, it costs an awful lot of money to fight those battles, and you might lose. So it's not very popular to take on a losing court battle. Yeah? A little confused by question. So, if, if the if the affirmative said, if if one of these people, one of these you know sets of students won in court, in the Supreme Court, 
What would like, like he would just like the federal funding would have just increased to uh, to school districts that didn't do this. The president just like said that he doesn't like support transit. Like, oh, I see what you're saying. So, that we have to take the initiative to get this like, so the federal courts can tell the president that the president is wrong. And as an aside, President Trump has not said that um, school districts cannot allow trans restroom access. The president has said up to this point that it's up to states and localities. All right, but if the Supreme Court weighed in on this, uh, as the Supreme Court did in gay marriage, there were people in the gay marriage decision, for instance, that refused to recognize marriage licenses that were between same-sex couples. And when that happened, and you're right, so there was resistance, when that happened, those cities and those clerks were prone to lawsuits, and that is where the change comes about. So I think that you're, you're on to something when you say that there will be resistance, but the court is, has built-in procedures that that even Donald Trump would struggle getting around, if that makes sense. Yeah. So for instance, when Donald Trump was lost, and he did lose several court cases on his travel restriction, all right, he couldn't just be like, I disagree. Now, he can appeal the decision, but you can't appeal beyond the Supreme Court, which is why the affirmative would probably use the Supreme Court. Two more, and then we'll keep going. Go ahead. So it is or is not unconstitutional to uh, not accommodate trans students? OK. So. The question is, is it constitutional or not to accommodate trans students, all right? And the answer is that the courts have not come up with a single answer to that question. And we exist in an absurd world where the law is different in one part of the country than it is in another part of the country, which means that if Julietta Mancho were to travel from Pittsburgh to rural Virginia, the policies would be different in those areas, all right? So that's, that's sort of... One of the reasons why the Supreme Court might actually take this case in the real world is to resolve that sort of patchwork of confusion. Yeah. So these cases that like favored and like favored the trans student, yes. do those precedents are those affecting more public schools or so all of this applies to public schools, right? Uh, that's a great question. The question was, does this apply to public schools? Yes. A private school um, can make its own procedures. Uh, and they don't exist with the threat of losing federal funds because private schools don't accept federal funds. They're private. Okay. All right. Last one. Go ahead. Uh, if the negative decides to read like uh, an amended counterplan, if the negative reads an amended counterplan, okay, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I like it. What are the solvency yeah. deficits to that argument that people make? Uh, the why the court is preferable, like judicial activism good. Yeah, there's a, there's a range of things about the importance of the judicial branch acting, but that that is a very good question. Okay, all right, so let's keep moving here. Here's how the federal courts work. There's actually 13 of them, although only 11 exist, all right? And, or only 11 are on that picture, 13 exist, sorry. One of them's in D.C., one of them 